Good morning and uh, welcome to another broadcast from Turnstile Tours, another virtual tour. I'm Stefan DW and uh, we've uh, now been God, over a hundred shows we've done here. We Turnstile Tours uh, is a uh, company that works with nonprofits to help increase their capacity to uh, uh, share their stories and uh, we usually do that through live in-person tours. Uh, so uh, that uh, didn't really mix very well with the lockdown. So back in early March, we pivoted to doing these virtual tours and it's uh, over a hundred of them now that we've done. And uh, the work I do with the water, uh, with the uh, turnstile tours is focused on the waterfront and maritime issues. Today, uh, the particular piece of the waterfront we're focused on is the Waterfront Museum. This is a wooden barge built in 1914. It's been moored in Red Hook since about 1994 and it's been the home of the guy who rescued it, a guy named David Sharps. Uh, so since it uh, moved to Red Hook, it's been his home. He raised his family there, uh, but it's been a home to people uh, earlier in its life too. We'll hear all about that from David Sharps in just a moment. If this is your first time joining us for Turnstile Tours, welcome. And welcome back to all those of you who've been here before. Uh, we're thrilled to have you back and uh, those of you new to it, a couple of ways to navigate this space. Uh, you'll find at the bottom of the screen, there is a chat button. If you click on that, it's a great way to uh, interact with people. We have backstage, uh, my colleagues, Amanda and Doug. And Amanda is there to help interface between you and uh, me and, and uh, David Sharps. So uh, you can drop your questions in the chat, introduce yourself, get to know Amanda and one another, let us know where you're chiming in from. Today I'm coming to you from Flushing, Queens in the uh, 1661 Bound House, which I look after. And uh, uh, hey, looks like we've got Howie out there. Great to see you, Howie, excellent. Uh, glad to have you back. And uh, also backstage, I mentioned we have Doug. So if you prefer to see uh, some approximation of what is being said, uh, Doug is there to help you. You can hit the uh, closed captioning button and Doug is typing away fiercely. I'll try to speak slowly so that uh, you can keep up and uh, so you can have that resource as well. A couple of things coming up. We are uh, pivoting a little bit again as things open up a little bit. As we get into the summer months, we're uh, changing things up a little bit. We have uh, one more program at 11 o'clock in the morning uh, and then we're going to switch to doing more 1230 and the afternoon programs, a little lunch hour program. But our last 11 o'clock in the morning program is gonna be Tuesday, our usual Maritime Tuesday. And I'll be back here uh, with uh, a colleague of mine from the Siemens Church Institute, Jonathan Thayer, who is uh, the senior archivist at the Siemens Church Institute, and assistant professor uh, uh, focused on archives at uh, Queens College. And uh, we'll be discussing this, uh, the Siemens Church Institute, which is an organization that's coming up on its centennial. Uh, its roots go back to the 1830s and the waterfront of New York and uh, the floating churches, uh, the work to uh, rid the waterfront of some of the worst labor practices that plagued seafarers at the time. But, and it's still quite active and attending to the needs of seafarers today. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that organization and its great online archive on Tuesday at 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and then on Thursday, that's uh, we kick off our 12:30 afternoon lunchtime programs, looking at uh, the that's the anniversary of the closing day of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Of course, it's where we keep our offices. And uh, Andrew Gustafson, who's uh, one of our our, uh, our leaders here at uh, Turnstile Tours, uh, with uh, Cindy, uh, his uh, his wife, they uh, start. She started the organization and he, of course, as you know, if you've seen any of our programs, has a, uh, a wealth of knowledge, particularly on the Navy Yard and on uh, 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 naval history. So he'll talk to us all about closing day. Uh, so yeah, that's what's coming up. Uh, got everybody on board here in the audience. Glad to see a lot of familiar and some uh, new names as well. Uh, but without further ado, let's uh, bring in David Sharps. So uh, David, welcome. Hi, everybody. Good to see you, David. Uh, uh, before the lockdown, at this time of day, I would be on my way to the barge to help you tell people about it. So it's, it's great to, to be back seeing the barge on a, a Saturday morning. 
and uh, telling people about it again. Uh, how are things over there in Red Hook? Uh, things are quiet. The harbor's a bit quiet. The skies are quiet. Um, the barge definitely misses having folks around. Um, I've kind of uh, zeroed in on a lot of maintenance projects and uh, I'm happy to be able to keep my hands and my mind busy with putting the, my efforts into this, uh, this old barge. Yeah, you used to have all kinds of visitors uh, on two feet and four feet. These days you mostly have uh, feathered guests. You got the, those geese have taken up residence. Family of Canadian geese have taken over the and, park. Uh, and you're They've taken to the water as of the last couple of days, I think. Oh, good, good. Hopefully they'll, uh, they'll do some exploring. And yeah. so you're right there on the very corner of Red Hook, about as far out as you can get. Uh, and uh, uh, there's the Fairway Supermarket in the old cotton warehouse behind you and uh, the uh, really uh, iconic spot, the Fort Defiance from the colonial period from the Revolutionary War was right by where you are. And, uh, and of course, you were on the front lines for Sandy and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about some of that during the tour. But why don't you, uh, I mean, this so. Where you are, you're on a, 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 tell us about what it is you're, where you're, you're talking to us from, uh, what, what this barge is, and, and give us a little bit of a look around, maybe. Sure. Uh, well, I'm going to turn my camera around here so you all can see things, but uh, we're on a barge that's 106 years old. Uh, there's a picture here of the barge of what it looked like when it was first built. Oh, yeah, just a little, a little down into the right, and we'll get a good view of it there. Yeah, that's the model you there. A, uh, a cabin up on top and uh, that cabin is where the captain and his family lived. So they had uh, families living on board the barge when it was first built is what you're saying? Yes, every barge had a family with it. Um, now the deck house is about 12 feet tall. Uh, it's 28 feet wide on the interior, 30 on the exterior, it's 90 feet long. The hall is about 10 feet deep, and the, uh, deck the deck house, like I mentioned, is 10 feet on the sides and 12 feet on the outsides. You've got quite a collection of stuff. This Rockland County sign, what's that about? Oh, the Rockland County was a push boat, uh, a tugboat, and uh, it was a very powerful one. The New York Central 26 up here. You can see that Conrad Milster donated that. Here's a picture of the con the the uh, of the 26. Of course, we got here's the 26 number from the New York Central tugboat. And Conrad Milster, yeah. So down a little bit. We're mostly seeing your oh, and you got your bell there. It's a little out of the picture, but. Uh, uh, so Conrad Milster, he's known, people may know him from, he, uh, he was the chief engineer at Pratt for a long time, and he was known for his uh, whistles that he would blow off on New Year's Eve. So, a time. lot of signboards. The salutation is now sunk down in St. Croix. It oh, wow. It was service down there, and you can scuba dive and see it. Here's the bellboard of the uh, Atlantic, uh, or sorry, the Orange Ferry that ran between Beacon and Orange. Um, the lights on either side, it was a double-ended ferry. Oh yeah, show us a little more up and right so we can see that light a little better. There you go, yeah. That was, yeah, those were the, they'd have to switch those since it was a double-ended ferry. Every time they'd pull into port, they'd switch them. This was Right, right, so the lights stay in place, but you light one half when you're going one direction, and the other half when you're going. Exactly. Yeah. And that was a sign, that wasn't the women's room, that was the women's half of the boat that they could go on. My understanding, correct me if I'm wrong here, but uh, didn't women, it, it wasn't like men couldn't go over there. It was just that that was the non-smoking side. And that's uh, really it how was, it was on the Staten Island Ferry. What I understood, it was a place where women could go and get out of harsh language and a lot of smoke. <laughs> yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Um, I can take you down uh, down below if you like. I can show yeah, you. Yeah, love uh, that. This is, this is not a place that we let people go normally. This is not open to the public. I mean, it's kind of it's not the safest place you're going right now. And we'll just pause for a moment. We're, we're a little frozen, but I'm sure. You can see we'll the bottom out. of the boat. I have the floorboard picked up. Yeah, it looks great. Wow. Pretty dry. Oh, yeah, very dry. 
And uh, last time the Coast Guard was here, they had a little patch that they wanted me to fix in one of the longitudinal beams that was sistered. So I finishing that up. There's a small block to go in there. Those are just massive pieces of timber there. And this is 1914 wood that we're looking at. And this is the utility room where we have an oil burner, two oil burners donated by Teledyne Lars. The whole heating system was donated by various companies like Bell and Gossett and Teledyne Lars and uh, heat what used to be uh, um, heatway hoses. Um, Howie comments, he says, was smoking really allowed on a wooden boat? And uh, yeah, no, certainly uh, on the, my, my understanding is that on the ferry boats, now not on the barge, there are signs all over the barge that say no smoking. Uh, but uh, here's a, a room, empty room down below that has an old uh, tug sign from the Sheridan that uh, the gentleman who had it made it into a bench. You know, every time I go on the barge, I see something I've never seen before. And I've been on that barge a lot. I've never seen that sign before. So uh, that that's the one side of the, the hull. And if I uh, go up and over, you can see the captain's quarters in the back. Now that's a portion of what used to be up top. And now it's down in the stern of the boat and that was a place where after they moved the families aboard uh, ashore this is where one person would have been able to uh, have his living accommodations and the reason they took the cabin off the top was because they took two of these posts out the so, deck so these, these posts that are the vertical posts that are staying up there there used to be more of those there used to be five and this barge carried rice and wheat and flour and sugar and things that would have been kept out of the weather. And they took the posts out in order to move goods around with forklifts and high lows. And once they took those forklifts and high lows out, they uh, it gave them a lot more space. Yeah, so you remove the posts and you get some extra. Wow, look, I love this painting. Is that this barge that you're on? Uh, that's. It, the barges that were around it, that was uh, Ronnie Engold's barges up in Edgewater, New Jersey. I found the barge. Is he the one in, that, that, that Joseph Mitchell talks about in his, yeah. uh, his story? Up in the old hotel, he talks about Ronnie Engold, and this was his shad fishing operation. Of course, this is the, the head that's on the upper deck. We, uh, so with the head, are you connected to, uh, what's your water situation like? Uh, we bring water on from the... Um, I've got a little shadow on your engraving there. There it is. New York City. That's a Ju uh, Julie Nadell there. That's a block print. Um, our... So water our, comes in from the city. City. Uh, we have no sewer, so we have a compost situation where we take our buckets directly to the Owl's Head sewer treatment plant um, themselves, our, ourselves. And that's, um, that's some serious commitment you've got there. So this is... Uh, uh, and and your flower pots. Everybody loves your flower pots. Yeah, and the, the shoes, of course, are always very popular. Pretty quiet today. Here comes a ferry. I don't know what you can see and what you can't. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just at, it's just at the top of our screen right in front of the Verrazano Narrows Bridge out there. And it looks like an NYC fast ferry doing the South Brooklyn route. And we're looking at the... Uh, Red Hook Flats, which are right here in the top part of the Red Hook Channel. And then, of course, you can see New Jersey. I don't know how much you can see across the way. There's the some clouds. Right there. but Okay, so I see right just above and to the left of your, your, your breast line there is the Statue of Liberty. We can just make it out with the Staten Island Ferry uh, leaving it in its wake. But we can just make out the ferry or the uh, statue. Now, when I got the boat, it had 300 tons of mud down this hatch. I've cut the hatch in, and uh, we've made uh, our abode for my wife and I. And when our kids were growing up, they were here as well. This is the side that we, we live aboard. This, we used some uh, windows that we have that go to the outside that give you an idea right, my, right around the water line. Huh, yeah. And then... Uh, this is the companionway that runs along the outside. It's divided into four different sections. 
but there are glass block windows that shutter light into the cabins that are on the inside. Ah. You can see the floorboards of an old barge that I had are what you see is the wall there that we put in across the cross braces in order to give us a little cabin here. This is the head <laughs> down below. This Your pocket is the, cleverly disguised, yeah. The master bedroom. And nobody ever sees this. This is a real treat to be able to go down below. This is the bulkhead that you see that goes down the center of the boat. It's so that's built, original to the barge that was always there? Those are six by 12s. Wow. Sitting on 12 by 12s that uh, make up that. These were, uh, this is a, one of my daughter's room that's now an office for my wife who is uh, working from home and this so is- You raised two daughters on the barge and they both moved off? That one's working for the Department of uh, Education in uh, policy and research and going to NYU to get her uh, degree in po public policy. And my other daughter works as a social worker with the criminal justice uh, agency. And how old were they when you moved on to the barge? When we moved on to the barge, um, they were uh, one and three. Wow. So Here that's really that all they know. I don't know if you can see that very well. We've been out of dry, in the dry dock twice. And the second time, we replaced several of the knees. There were about eight of these knees. If this you drop down a little bit, we'll see the knee better there. Yeah. yeah so that's the all, all the red, a little higher. Yeah. The bottom is one that was new, and the top one we were able to save. Oh, and wow, yeah. There's one here that you can see that was top and bottom, a double knee. And the entire bottom plank all across the bottom of the boat was, uh, was replaced. It was getting eaten, eaten up uh, by carpenter ants, it looked like, or some type of uh, biological activity. All right, now we're back up on the main deck. So when the barge was carrying freight, what was below the deck that you're on now? Uh, nothing was used there. The, it was just used for a couple of uh, um, uh, ropes maybe on the landing, but uh, everything that they used to carry for easy on and easy off were used through, uh, everything was stored on this deck and uh, I, I could open a cargo door if you like. Yeah, yeah, sure. Let's take, get a sense of that. So, so we're basically looking at a, float, a floating box car here. Exactly. Everything came in through the cargo doors, either from the pier or from a boat. Wow. That's very dramatic. And there's fairway just behind you. <laughs> and there's four of them. And above the doors are hatches, and the hatches, we have skylights on now, but they were originally a hatch that uh, was, was made of the same tongue and groove. That, uh, so it would be covered, and then you could take the cover off to get uh, cargo through the hatch. Exactly. No I, did put, I did put together uh, some slides to show some of the work that I've yeah, done. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Um, so, oh, and Barbara asks what a knee is. She says it looks like a foot. That's uh, uh, I like that observation. So, a knee is a piece of wood that uh, 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 helps join uh, perpendicular or nearly perpendicular parts of a boat. Uh, they were often made of uh, tamarack roots, so they would uh, cut down a larger a tamarack and uh, where the uh, uh, the the trunk of the tree met the root, it had a natural curve to it. And those would frequently turn up uh, as uh, as ship's knees. Uh, the Bound House has ship's knees in its construction to do the same job of joining walls to uh, to ceiling. Cool, cool. Yeah, hacky tack is what they used to call them. Yeah, yeah. They would have big yeah. trunks that would, uh, you know, where the tree and the limb go together, they'd have big sections cut out and they would cut it out of the actual limb and the trunk together so they could get that support of a, of a strong... Uh, uh, knee shaped, the, the L shaped growth. Beats bending the wood, yeah. So a lot of times people wonder, you know, what, how did I ever get into this situation where I'm 
got a 106 year old barge and uh, it was really uh, starting out working as a, uh, a juggler on cruise ships. That I seems like an obvious sort of way to get into this. Not um, at all, that's remarkable. You can see the slides? Yeah, yeah, it looks great. You're okay, saving so a pile of, of, of what? That's, those are cannonballs in Greece. I, I felt like uh, I had reached <laughs> a juggler's heaven when I came across <laughs> these in Rhodes, Greece. But I worked for uh, Carnival Cruise Lines as a clown and a juggler with their stage shows. And the ship that I worked on was bought for $1. Um, the Mar TSS Mardi Gras was the first ship that Carnival Cruise Lines had. And when I joined, it was the only ship that Carnival Cruise Lines had. I you had, said it was bought for a dollar? Uh, it was. The owner, uh, Mickey Aronson's father, I think his name, uh, uh, his father bought it for one dollar from, as the Empress of Canada. Was oh, the, one of those. it was a retired ocean liner. Right. I did Not work on the festival while I was there, and uh, I was able to... Uh, oh, we went to Paris for a second there. What happened? Yeah, I uh, then went to Paris where I studied with Jacques Lecoq, but being around the water, I soon uh, found myself on a houseboat. Um, the little cabin that you see there on the white in white was uh, this I took a picture of when I went back to Paris and this was somebody else was living in it, but I had the captain's quarters, which was in the stern of the vessel and the wheelhouse and then the little kitchen that was right in front of there. Um, I uh, Now, is this back in New York? Is this Lincoln Center? This was Lincoln Center out of doors. The name of my company was called Serious Foolishness with uh, Karen Leslie and myself. Uh, now she is uh, Karen McCarty. And uh, we did film and uh, TV and a lot of commercials here in the New York City area and launched a company called Serious Foolishness. Of course, we love going to South Street Seaport and taking our ball machine there it was always a, a fun thing to work in the streets and, uh, and bring together people with our entertainment uh, there on the streets of uh, New York City as well. I was in the film Her Alibi. You can see me there on the lower left-hand side with huh. Tom Selleck, uh, thanks to uh, Michael Bongar and a group of other clowns that went down and performed in Baltimore. Um, the Gary Barge, when I came to uh, New York City, I lived aboard a barge of a, a film producer by the name of Jerome Gary, who produced Pumping Iron, which I believe uh, helped launch Arnold Schwarzenegger's career but his barge I was caretaker of, and this was the interior of that barge. Wow. In North Bergen, New Jersey, just Wait, near- Wait, is that your stove that you still have today? That's where that stove came from. Oh, and wow. And the cabinets came from. Oh, yeah, look at that. Yeah, all of that was uh, kind of reclaimed when we left. Um, it was a, a, a beautiful existence there. You know, they always say if, uh, it's better to have a friend with your boat, uh, have a boat than rather have a boat yourself. And <laughs> yep. One step above that, it's better to be a caretaker of a boat that uh, you can <laughs> be on and uh, always, it's somebody else's problem. But having lived on this boat, um, the Gary Barge, I bought it from Jerome when he moved out to uh, LA. And it was a long Gary Barge. Why is it called the Gary Barge? Uh, because it was owned by Jerome Gary. It was oh, I got you. Pennsylvania. Sorry. Pennsylvania Railroad Barge. Gotcha. Um, this is a picture of it. It had cedar shakes there on the side, but I started, I, development came and said, listen, kid, we're going to build uh, a marina and uh, condos here. You, you know, you're not part of our plan. You got to leave. And it was at that time that we formed the Hudson Waterfront Museum. And uh, I moved all the stuff that I had on that barge and somebody, uh, a tugboat captain had told me about, he said, if David, if you, if you like what you're doing with the barges, you should go look at the Lehigh Valley 79 up in Edgewater. So I went up to Edgewater. One of the, I floated my stuff up there in the end. You can see my oil tanks there in the back. Uh -huh. uh, Ronnie Engold's uh, five horsepower motor took my stuff up river from wow. one barge to the other. And they, we were in the mud flats. It went to mud. Um, this is, and this is what Joseph Mitchell describes. This is exactly what he talks about in the book. 
And this is the, that's his shad poles that you see laying there in the mud. He'd right. store them in the mud. Um, in the mud, you know, they were less, uh, they were looked after a little bit better than uh, storing them up in the, yeah. uh, on, on land. But this is what the barge looked like when I first wow. found it. Um, it was an uninsulated structure. Um, bought it for $500 from Harry Shellhorn, who was a dock builder. Wait, and wait, I keep seeing, you know, I've seen all these articles that say you bought it for a dollar. Uh, I bought it for, uh, I but gave him $500 and he, I asked for a receipt because I went downtown to the city hall and uh, started my uh, company with my asset that I had. And when I asked him for a receipt, he gave me a, a, a receipt that said $1 and other considerations. So <laughs> in deference to him, I always said I was, I bought it for $1 because he got it. It was better. I didn't disclose I got it so cheaply because he probably had a lot of equipment that he wanted to sell for quite a lot more. Got so it. For a long time I did say I bought it for a dollar, but I did give him five hundred dollars and wondered what the other four hundred and ninety nine dollars were for many <laughs> years until I found out that uh, lo and behold, it's a real estate term that uh, you know, buy a home and you don't want to tell how much you paid for it, you know, you have to tell the IRS, but if you want to make it public and you don't want to tell the price, you say a dollar and other considerations. Uh, you know, I don't know a lot of $500 boats out there. I, there are multi-thousand dollar boats and there are free boats, but there's nothing <laughs> in between. Right. Well, I, I wanted to make them an offer and I had done some research, found out down at Fill Your Belly Deli at the, in Edgewater that uh, the barge had been offered for sale when it was afloat for $2,000. So I wanted to make him a good, uh, serious yeah. offer. So I said, how about $500? And he looked down at the dock and kind of kicked it and said, all right, go ahead, have fun with it. So uh, he, he that's was- That's lovely. Uh, well, you, now you've made several references to railroads and railroad barges. And for those of you who missed the program or are unfamiliar with these, uh, we did a program very early on in our 100 programs about uh, intermodal transportation, talking all about these railroad barges and how the railroads uh, connected from New Jersey to Manhattan and Brooklyn and other parts of the harbor with these barges they own. So uh, uh, I don't, don't know if we'll get time to talk about that in much depth today, but uh, that's and a good There are different kinds of barges. There were certainly, I can see over here on the, the left, the stick lighter barge, which is oh, a yeah. barge. Here's a covered barge like mine that would have kept things out of the weather uh, uh, protected. Here's a scow, an open deck barge. And like here was the, uh, railroad, yeah. the barge that uh, Ronnie had uh, kept the most, which was, his, which was his home. These were my neighbors up there in Edgewater. Um, this was a lovely New York Central stick lighter that was beside me. Uh, um, absolutely gorgeous. Uh, I, I loved it and was, I hated to have to see these things go, but the Army Corps had a drift removal program and what we didn't uh, take out, uh, what, what wasn't floated and taken away was just gonna be uh, demolished through the, the, the bucket that was coming along. Wow. This was, uh, the, there were a lot of boat clubs that were using these boat barges. This was the Manhattan Yacht Club and uh, Joey Harboe, who was the Commodore of that boat club. Um, this was exactly the first what day. I think of when you say yacht club, that is exactly the image that comes to mind. Well, the old, the old um, motorboat uh, clubs were, you know, it was a place where you could, for a hundred bucks, you could keep your boat, but you also had to help keep the walkways and attend the meetings. And, you know, you, you helped with the maintenance of the place. And it was, a, you know, a lot of mechanics and bus drivers and, and janitors and just a, your normal people that, uh, you know, love getting their family out in the, into the into the river. Is that Riverbank State Park in the background? The yeah, uh, that would be yes. Oh, yes. Wow. Right across Edgewater is right across from uh, that area of Manhattan. First got day it. I got in, this was uh, uh, Sher Harry Shellhorn's uh, stuff. He was at this point just using it as a place to store things that he needed to uh, store from for his operation he was uh, had many different barges and boats and would build docks um, when i finally came up to the boat uh, barge this was what that uh, raft of uh, uh, the, the couple of rafts that i unloaded this was uh, what the space looked like when i first got it 
The floors were some of the first things that we worked on trying to get down to good wood. The captain's quarters. Wow, yeah, it's recognizable. I mean, the paint's cleaned up and everything, but you can still, it's still, that's we what it looks like. We to keep the same, you know, yellow color, the two-tone gray on the bottom, yellow on the top. Of course, my challenge was to float it because down below was about anywhere from five to eight feet of mud. And I used these- So it's sitting on top of the mud, but it's got mud in it. Yes, over time, the when the tide would come in, it wasn't floating so that the- the, the silt that was in the water silted out of the mud in the very contained hull, and it left me the mud that was basically as deep as the river was that came in. So when I got it there, it, it sat on the low end about five feet of mud and on the high end about eight feet of mud. And these, uh, wow. these uh, three inch gasoline pumps is what I used to uh, start pumping out the hull. This was the hall when I started finally getting down to the bottom and starting to see the bottom of the boat and the big timbers that one run athwart ships um, where we just walked was on the inside, which I made uh, the living quarters on the inside and the companion way is on your left here. And that big bulkhead here that has, you can see where the water and the mud was, um, that, that's the bulkhead in the center. Got it. Um, I was only 29 when I bought the boat and I really, I had never run a power tool in my life. So being a clown and a juggler, I could now call myself a fool as well. <laughs> well, that's how things happen. The first uh, shipwright I had was a friend of a friend who was an artist, uh, James Kovic, and uh, he uh, turned the barge into his studio when he wasn't working, but he was a uh, a very good carpenter and uh, between uh, him and myself and other volunteers and help, we were able to get the barge into his hometown, which was Hoboken, New Jersey. Uh, Mayor- Edison, wow. This was coming into the Erie Lackawanna Plaza. Um, Captain Pam and Captain Dick are on this boat towing us. And uh, at that site, we had Captain Dick's 1898 Philip T. Feeney that we also put on display there in, the, there's Captain Dick. Huh. When he first floated in, he said, I never thought I'd be towing a wooden barge into Hoboken again. Uh. But there we were, that was our look uh, after they dropped us off and they left. We left us with a tug and a barge right at the foot of, uh, I wanna say Washington Street. Right by the, uh, the, the ferry terminal there. Yes, the Erie Lackawanna. Lackawanna Plaza, yeah. And uh, it kind of took us back in time. Here, uh, uh, we were at the end of the street, you could see activity on the waterfront and waterfront access has always been what the museum has been about besides- They've our attracted a small fan there in this photo. Yes, yeah, so he showed up with his little French uh, uh, mariner shirt. It was a perfect- uh, <laughs> a perfect time to, for, for the photo op. And here we are christening the boat. This is Captain Mayor Pasquale who ran with a waterfront access plan on his campaign. He did come in. Uh, this was my partner, Karen Leslie. Here's Captain Pam, uh, Captain Dick and myself and one of the deck hands were christening the boat. Uh, it would have been about uh, 1989. But, but you kept the original name. We kept the original name, yep. First day that we opened our doors, we had over a thousand people come because there was a waterfront festival. Ah. Um, New York Times came down and featured uh, our opening and we just were very tickled with uh, having launched a new maritime museum in New York City and thus began my romance with the New York Harbor. I didn't know much, but old timers would come down and I've heard so many stories about wow. the, the people who worked the ropes and made the big old fenders, the puddings, um, take about a week to make uh, one. By pudding, things. you mean the, the sort of beard-like thing that sits on that, the front of the tugboat? Yes. Is that they, what's going on here? Yes, that's, uh, you had rope wrapped around rope. This would go on the bow of a, of a tugboat to, to protect both the pier and the barges and the vessel itself. That was a Messick tugboat that uh, we, Walter Messick came, we had uh, uh, Lance Metz come, we had Jim Lee come. Wait, Lance Metz, really? 
Oh, yes. We had a lot of people come to help. Len Smith, he was a, a recently passed on, I'm sorry to say, but he was a great historian of uh, canal boats in, from the Lehigh Valley. Yes, yes. We, and we did a lot of history programs, and we started uncovering Jersey City and Hoboken's history in connection with the waterfront. Gowanus tugboat and a, some sort of a houseboat contraption barge there in the back double-decker. Oh, it almost looks like one of the uh, barges they used to ferry immigrants to uh, Ellis Island. That's uh, yeah, possibly. No I'm that. not quite sure what that is, but you can see it's the whole crew of the Gowanus there gathered. Yeah. We, our first exhibit that we did was on the Lighteridge era that uh, tells the story of what the barge was doing and, and prior to highways and tunnels and trucking, you know, everything was uh, the railroad and its connection. And oh, the, wow. this was a insulated barge inside of a insulated barge. They would have used uh, horsehair to uh, put between the, the battens and the outside wall that they built there. Here's another picture of that New York Central uh, 20. Oh, yeah, this is the picture you were trying to show us before, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. This is a signboard, and we have the signboard of this one, and also its numbers that you see. Uh, up, I guess the number would have been up in the front, but this, uh, if you can see in the back here, this is a very unusual boat. It's a express lighter. It's a tugboat and a barge, and they would use that for, you know, express mail or or to go out and get stuff that nobody had. If you could get things into town that everybody needed before everybody else, you could sell it out pretty quickly. Hey, I mean, uh, Elise, otherwise known as my mom, wants to know were the insulated barges, uh, what were they used for? They could have been used to carry things that they wanted to, uh, you know, keep from freezing when it was real cold or things that you wanted to refrigerate using a big, uh, you know, blocks of ice in order to uh, uh, keep them. Uh, like perishables, like produce perishable. or. Uh, yes, produce yeah. and I would think fruits and vegetables. Meat, yeah. You know, that. And a lot of meat came in on the hoof, of course. But that's, uh, that's true. Um, you can see the, before they had the rope they used, they would use wood. Yeah, I see that in pictures all the time. So these are yeah. fenders. Those are their fenders. Wow, and they're just strips of wood. They're just strips of wood that would be wow. hanging over. Here's a good picture showing the captain's quarters up on top. Yeah, on the 80s. And that's a Lehigh Valley tug and barge. And I might say there is still a Lehigh Valley tug in the harbor that is uh, run by Matt Perricone, the Cornell. It's a uh, 1940-something, I believe. Yeah, right? yeah, it's a later one. Hey, just yeah. to let you know, we're getting into the last quarter of our time here. So uh, I don't know okay. how many photos you want to show, but. Give I'm going to pick things up here. This was our first port of call after Hoboken was um, Jersey City, where it ended up being right behind where you would take the circle line. Okay. Beautiful views of the yeah. towers. We were uh, out there before Liberty State Park uh, became uh, before the Liberty State Science Center was there. So there wasn't a whole lot of traffic, but it was the original home of where the, water, the, the Lehigh Valley worked out of. So it was in the, what they called the big basin of the Morris Canal. So this is where the Morris Canal that went out into Pennsylvania came to New York City. On the left is a train station of the New York Central, uh, Central New Jersey Railroad. And on the right are all the barges that would come into the diagonal finger piers. And on the right are the stake barges, which were already loaded up, ready to go, or being ready to be loaded, that were car floats that would actually take train cars here off the, uh, the car floats. They had a few places where you could bring a car float in and load these up with railroad cars. Yeah, you know, we talked about car floats in a couple of shows. And so most of what we're seeing here, uh, the, the, the angled piers, that's Lehigh Valley Railroad, but then the straight lines, all those train uh, lines uh, off on the left side, that's all Central Railroad, New Jersey. Yeah, As I understand it, uh, the Lehigh Valley Railroad bought the Morris Canal in large part to gain access to this piece of waterfront close to New York City. 
that was like 19, no, like 1870s, 1890s, I think they bought it. But I'll have to look that up later. So uh, putting it into operation, after we found out that the same group of historians were coming to see, the faithful group of historians were coming to see our shows, we decided to uh, take some of our entertainment and see if we could bring in a wider a variety of people. Here's a picture of the Periwinkle. That was a Periwinkle Blue Barge that actually had actors uh, traveling with the show here in the New York Harbor. So in the spirit of showboats, we started bringing, this is uh, Stephen Ringgold of, uh, then of Bond Street and now with the Grand Falloons. Uh, we took the boat to several different places. One of them was Piermont in this location. We put art exhibits on the barge. This is a uh, uh, exhibit of Bob Foster, who was our curator, who put a neon exhibit down where we just were in the hold. Hey, by the way, uh, what, you'll want to know that uh, we have Kim Denny out there uh, in Indianapolis, representing Margaret Cronin, family of William Canty, Captain William Canty. Wonderful, wonderful. Welcome, Tim. Um, the plays, this was Lifeboat that we did, Alfred Hitchcock's uh, uh, play about, about uh, it was a movie. That we yeah, yeah, famous, the, sort of the one-shot effect, but uh, you did the play version. Yeah, um, and then we finally came to Red Hook. I was at a meeting with Pete, sitting between Pete Seeger and uh, Michael Mann, who founded uh, the Brooklyn uh, Center of the Urban Environment, and he told me, you know, go to Brooklyn, go to Brooklyn. So he sent me first to Buddy Scotto, who sent me to Greg O'Connell, and uh, pretty soon we found ourselves at the foot of Conover Street. And our research has found out that at the foot of Conover Street, right where we landed, there used to be a floating bathhouse. Of course, before there were baths in people's homes, people went to bathhouse, bathhouses. And in Red Hook, you could actually go swim in the river and then come up and take your bath in the bathhouse. So it's also, a barge, but it's got it, it like, but somehow the river is getting in, there's a pool inside the barge that's made of river water. This is when they finally had running water. Oh, okay. Because I know up in uh, Manhattanville at 125th Street, West 125th Street, they had them where they, they had slats in the bottom and the river came up through the slats. It was like a ring shaped barge. Those were swim, yeah, swimming holes. Yeah. 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 This was actually a bathhouse. Wow. Yeah. Um, this is also some pictures of the foot of Conover Street, thanks to Urban Archives. This oh, yeah. shows the, the piers the, at the end of Conover Street and the big old rock jetty under construction. Wow. And wow. this is where we landed here in Red Hook, 1994. My kids were one and three years old. And uh, this was, as you people know, the fairway building. This was before they cut all the windows in. These were the Red Hook stores, New York Dock Company. I find that remarkable. I mean, so we can see that there were doors there accessing the warehouse, but right only at the, the very middle. center. Yeah. And, and so when Greg O'Connell developed it, he kept that same idea. Uh, but, uh, you know, the paint's gone, but he still he kind of kept that idea of the windows. That's great. So thanks to Con Edison, we had a bus that would go through Cobble Hill and Park Slope and bring people throughout South Brooklyn to the barge. And we started doing programs with the uh, uh, local youth here that would be arts programs and get them down to the waterfront and also do a series of entertainment programs. And what was Red Hook like in those days? Uh, it was pretty much a, a, a no man's land. Um, there wasn't, uh, there was wild dogs, there was not a lot of people, um, and, uh, you know, I always tell people you couldn't bring, you, you couldn't get Chinese food delivered. They just say, you know, we don't go to Red Hook. Wow. Cabbies didn't like to come to Red Hook. Wow. But uh, we did start experiencing problems in 2000 and 1998 is when the boat started leaking a lot. And these next oh. series of pictures is the first time that the barge actually went to dry dock. And so a boat came down and the Benjamin Elliott and it towed us all the way up past all the, uh, what we know as New York City and the island and the tug and the barge. We didn't know, this was right after 9-11. This is wow. right after you know, everything, the economy has collapsed and here I am on a sinking boat. And uh, I decided I was gonna go to dry dock and try to do the best that we could. 
we would see what we could uh, best manage. And we went up under all of the bridges. The old Apple Sea, wow. Up into, uh, above Waterford, uh, where this is a drawing. Was that the Erie Canal? Was that a lock? Yes, that's the, uh, that's the federal lock. Um, and then you go, we were behind lock number three, where we finally got put down, and North Atlantic Shipbuilding and Repair, over the course of 100 days, helped take apart this boat. We ended up, once we put it down, it was the first time I had seen the boat, because I had worked in the mud flats and done the best I could on anything I could reach when the tide was out, but of course I couldn't get to the bottom. Our biggest culprit, little, little did we know, was the shipworms of the New York oh, Harbor. Oh, yeah. The cleanliness of the waters, all of a sudden there was a vast increase in the shipworms and anything made of wood, whether it was a, a piling, a dock, or a wooden barge, was getting eaten ferociously. Yeah, there was that pier at the Brooklyn Navy Yard that collapsed because Absolutely. the Clean Water Act got the water clean and the uh, shipworms came back. Yeah, so we started taking off the sides of the boat, which the sides of the boat are five inches thick. And this plank was about 14 inches wide. Wow. Wow. As we had all the bow and the stern apart, it gave us a chance to come in and, and sister wood that we thought was going to not, uh, uh, that, that looked to be a little bit weak. So we sistered uh, the frames both on the bow and the stern, and that plank that you saw down below was one of the ones that was sistered. Um, whenever Howie we, has said he noticed that one of the uh, images said the boat was built in Perth Amboy. And, uh, yes, Perth Amboy, yes. Down there in New um, Jersey. Right before that, they were building them over here in uh, Robbins Dry Dock here in the Erie kind of, in the Erie Basin, but they later oh, wow. went down to uh, Perth Amboy. Um, once we took the bottom off, you see here spiles. These are wooden um, dowels that are driven up into to fill the void of where all the spikes came out. That ah. way you, you keep your compression of the wood by ramming up new wood into these. Uh, uh, where all the spikes were. So these, this was a picture taken before we cut those off flush and, and took them and drove them into the next bay. And you can see we're sitting on like Jersey barriers. This was huh. our load of new wood that arrived. That's about in 2002, that was about uh, $22,000 worth of long leaf yellow pine that wow. came out of a forest down in South Carolina when they were building a mall and that went, actually went to court and they had signed uh, loggers to go in, and I was able to get some of that uh, coveted longleaf yellow pine wood. Here's a long 30-foot longleaf yellow pine plank getting rolled under after it's been uh, cut to size, being rolled into place. Of course, huh. then we pre-drill. Uh -huh. And then drill ahead that you can see right above his head, we drill a big, these are timber bolts, and we wanted it to lie flush because with the shipworms, our idea was to cover it in tar and then sheath it with a new high-tech material that was donated to us by Cleardex called Kydex, which is a, about an eighth-inch plastic sheathing that we put on uh, the bottom and the sides. And Here's our brand new bottom. Everything. David has a problem, he goes to the Kydex. Yes. <laughs> That in the green stuff, the pedal That's right. that donates our uh, two-part epoxy compound. This is our brand new bottom that was uh, put in between the, 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 the ways that we're sitting on. Of course, the last plank, how do you put the last plank in? Whether you actually put a vise into the plank below it, and these are special clamps called Jenny clamps that David Short and North Atlantic Shipbuilding and Repair had that was able to push that last plank into place. Wow. And that's the, the quirky thing about the barge, you know, it's, it's symmetrical, but we were looking at the stern there, weren't we? Uh, yes, that's the stern. Because the, uh, the end boards, the boards that face the, you know, the direction you would uh, travel, uh, the side boards that is go all the way to the end. They go all so the, the way flush. Yeah. Seam and this you don't is want, in, yeah. Exactly. These are inset so that when the water is rushing down the side that it would run past the seam and not allow uh, water to get in that. And that was the knowledge of the Lehigh Valley Canal Company. They were the only company that knew uh, boat building, all the New York Central and Pennsylvania Central. They were building their halls like matchboxes. All right, because uh, Lehigh Valley Railroad, Asa Packer, started out as a canal builder. Exactly. And, and, uh, 
led the, uh, the Lehigh Valley Railroad. And the yeah. old timers always told me, if you're going to buy a barge, make sure you buy a Lehigh Valley barge. And sure enough, they're the ones that have, uh, it's the one that is uh, lasted because we're the only surviving one of its kind wow. uh, left. Or Here's Don Taub, the master caulker, God bless his soul, from South Street Seaport. He uh. caught practically all of the, the boat by himself, chinking it along uh. there. Of course, the question is, how do you change the last plank? You're like sitting on your hands. How do you, move, how do you change that plank that we're looking at there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, little did I know that that would be one of the worst days of my life. <laughs> All I had to do was move the boat about seven feet so that we had finished up. And you can see we're going to move the barge about seven feet to the left. So we tried to float the barge and move it and set it back down so we could then get all those planks that were uh, what were on the ways. We would just have those 10 planks to replace. Well, here we are getting ready to make the move, what they call the, 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 the shift or the float. And lo and behold, this is the dry dock before they flooded it. They started flooding the dry dock and lo and behold, my barge didn't float. Oh. They opened the gates wide, trying to make some time. And before we knew it, my entire lower quarters was filled with about eight feet of water. It was an absolute catastrophe. New York State Canal Corporation, who had donated the dock, came after we had uh, filled the barge. We obviously had to let the, the water out and try again. They said, David, how can we help you? I said, I need pumps. And they got us a huge, it must have been a five inch, six inch pump. It was massive, ran on 440 electricity. We got two, three of the regular pumps and we were successful in moving it that little bit. And then here we find ourselves after the project was over, we got down into, put the, the, the barge on display at the tugboat roundup. One of the best places you can get aboard a tug and uh, is to go to the tugboat roundup that's usually the weekend after Labor Day in September. And here we were featured in 2002. And that's also at the Erie Canal. I think we saw this view in, uh, in Will Van Dorp's show that we did a couple weeks ago. The nice thing about a barge is it's a nice open space where you can get people together for programs. And we'd have the old tug captains and music and sea shanties. All of that was happening. Here's us moving back to Red Hook. And when we came back, we ended up in the Gowanus Canal because the, here, the dock that we were located, the shipworms, we had defeated the shipworms on the barge, but they had eaten the pier while we were away and our dock had collapsed. Wow. So I was, the old lady was all dressed up with no place to go. <laughs> and uh, thanks to John Quadrosi over in uh, the Gowanus Canal, we went over and sat off of uh, Columbia Street as a over little- by the grain elevator, here. right? What's that? By the grain elevator, right? Right by the grain elevator. Uh -huh. So we moved our operation there and we started building over by, uh, uh, back at our other site uh, using steel pipes and a huge crane. This is us rebuilding the pier in Red Hook. Wow. I'll go th quickly through these. We, uh, with the, uh, Pipes were sunk into the river. Timber clusters were added that had lateral support and aluminum gangways were added so that our ship, that we, here's that same building with the yeah, windows. Yeah, now they've got windows, look at that. Yeah. Here you see the timber cluster and the, the, uh, the lateral support. You can't just put a, a pile straight in, the barge would knock it over. So here we are with the lateral support. This is our finished pier. Wow. All of this was done uh, with federal, state, and local permits. So we put about a quarter of a million dollars into the barge repair, only to have to turn around and put another quarter of a million dollars into our dock in Red Hook. Wow. This was our new dock where you find us now. And what year is that that we're looking at there? Uh, uh, 2005. Okay. And of course, our gangways were delivered by land. This was the nice gentleman who showed up with our gangway. And he just picked the gangway up from the street and lifted it all the way over here. You see the gangway being picked up off the truck and placed over here uh, between the, uh, to, to give access ramps to the barge. 
I know we just have a couple minutes left. I, I wanted, uh, we got like two more minutes that we can do slides and then I want to get to the, uh, the, the, uh, the ball machine, everybody's favorite thing. Okay. The, uh... So as the Coast Guard came, this goes, shows you some of the work that we've done, just taking apart the bow and the stern and, you know, work continues here at, on our dock side that finally got the metal branches back on board. All of these are just various decks work that we did. And then of course we started taking the barge on the road. Here we are in Poughkeepsie and Hudson River Park, Hoboken, Hudson River Park again. My kids performing, they'd grown <laughs> up and been out performing music and acrobatics and plays with Brave New World and school groups filling the barge, happenstance ah. theater, all these various shows and artwork. We've actually had a chance to uh, you know, bring the barge back to life. Stephen Mallon wow. and his great work. And here is Alice Scanlon, who we met. She's uh, uh, 94 years old, and she grew up on the 59. Her and father- And again, over at Henry Street at the, uh, that's the grain elevator, right? Mm, I'm not, I don't, I don't know. Sure. Okay. I'm not, not sure. Here's All one right. in Jersey City. We keep meeting, meeting families like uh, the family of William Canty, and we're hoping to, to find these stories. Another book that was told about three ladies who owned the barge um, in, uh, uh, in the Gowanus. That's right, yeah, that's a great story. And this is my chance to say thank you after all these years in the mud, my, my wife and my kids, you know, I thank one all the carpenters and the volunteers, our board who's been great, Greg O'Connell and, and just all these people that brought it together um, to make it a big it community effort to keep this barge going. So uh, maybe to signal things off, I'll stop sharing my screen and, yeah. and see if I can do that properly. Yeah. So, so among the, so you're a performance space, but you're also kind of a, an art gallery and you got a couple of things we saw a painting earlier on. So we're back to sharing your screen. Let's see. How do I get to, uh, uh so we want, I think at the there. top yep. it says stop. There you go. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, but this, what are we looking at here? Can you see it? Is that a good yep. spot? Yep, that's great. Okay, I can go and not. Uh... This is a. See the ball going up? Yep, that looks great. George Rhodes audio kinetic sculpture. All your bells there on the barge, that oleo curtain rolling down looked fabulous. A couple balls in the machine. You'll stay with us, folks, for just a couple moments as we uh, watch this. And you'll see George Rhodes sculptures all over the world, but let's see what this one does. I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't make you smile. I don't know what to do for you. That's beautiful. Well, thank you, David. I I, I'm, I hope uh, that you will get to the chance to go visit your barge again in person in the very near future and, and that uh, we'll all be able to see the rest of your photos in person. Uh, I'm going to bring my video back on. Um, hey, but, thank you. And uh, yeah, we'll look forward to talking to you more at that time. Thanks everyone for joining us today. And uh, again, please join us again on Tuesday for more waterfront stories. We have, uh, we're visiting the Siemens Church Institute on Tuesday, learning about its iconic building at 25 South Street and all the work they've been doing for, uh, since the early 19th century. And Thursday at 12.30 at new time, we'll be doing a closing day of the Brooklyn Navy Yard when the Navy left. Uh, so thank you again for joining us and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Have a great day.